All right, I want to good morning, good evening, and good day to people around the world. My name is Mike Benkovich, and I'm here to talk to you today about data options in Azure. Where's my stuff? Where do I put my data so that I can work with it whenever, however I need to? I uh, just kind of want to give you a little bit of background. If you want to reach out to me, I'm available on a number of different things. Um, Twitter fee feedback on Facebook, et cetera. Um, I'm coming to you live from Minneapolis uh, in Minnesota in the US where, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, today's uh, session is uh, kind of a uh, abbreviated version. If you want more information, you can go out to, uh, I did a course on LinkedIn Learning that will uh, dive deeper into all of these. But really it's all about with data and data in the cloud and how do we go out and decide what we want to do and how do we work with um, the cloud? How do we make our information really make sense? Um, there's a number of different questions you have when you start working with data uh, and you start looking at the cloud and, and trying to make sense of all of these questions. That's what this talk is going to be all about. Um, I've, I've got a website. If you are, are interested in more information on this, um, you can go out to my website, but I'll show you that uh, in a little bit. But really, it's all about data. It's the challenges of working with information that comes from a lot of different places, coming from different sources, different regions. Um, sometimes it's formatted, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's related, related to other things, whether it's top down or bottom up. We've got to figure out how do we connect the dots? How do we relate things together? How do we work with information like streaming data, where you have high volumes of data going through? Uh, analytics, being able to get insights, being able to see how it is that we can uh, make smart decisions. Um, how do we Okay, you can hear me? Good. So it looks like uh, you can hear my, my, hear my me talking and see um, we're talking about where all the data can come from. You know, all these different places, the different types of information, um, secure information, sensitive information. Uh, we want to be able to audit. We want to be able to log it. We want to be able to uh, work with this. And you know, the challenges of this is how do we make this into something that is going to really work for us? Um, the data that we use can be used for a lot of different things, whether it's transactional systems, analytical systems, doing reporting, whether it's insights, uh, working with you know streaming, looking at trends and how data comes through. With all of these things, we wanna be able to see how do we go out and explore the data and work with it and make it so that we can go out and query and use this information in a secure way. Every time we go out and run this, we wanna be able to get uh, the data back in a reasonable amount of time, whether the internet is there or not. Uh, we wanna be able to tune it and be able to scale it uh, scaling up to meet the demand of whatever uh, kind of usage uh, things that we see, see coming across. We want to be able to protect it, secure it, encrypt it. We want to be able to lock it down. Um, and at the same time, we want to minimize costs. We don't want to go out and spend more than we have to to be able to uh, get uh, things to be um, to work. Can we be muted again? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, so you can hear me. Okay, good. Um, so inside of uh, the cloud, you know, we've got a number of different options uh, working with data. We can work with relational data where we've got uh, uh, databases like SQL Server, Oracle, uh, MySQL, Postgres, um, there's a lot of different ways we can go out and work with different relational databases. But relational is not the only kind of data that we might want to work with. Um, while it works well for on-premises and when I'm first going to the cloud, it's a nice, easy first step. There's also not, you know, uh, types of data stores that are also useful. Things like uh, Azure Storage, where we've got blobs, tables, queues, files where we've got uh, the ability to work with NoSQL, like uh, Mongo databases or uh, Cosmos, which is, <clears throat> which is an implementation that allows us to scale up um, without the same type of uh, limitations you have on relational. Um, but the, on the other hand, we also have to have a much stronger kind of a way that we're gonna focus on going out and um, 
consume and work with that data. Um, the third type is really doing you know, the storage for working with streaming data, things where you've got uh, information that's coming through and you want to get insights on it before the data lands. You want to be able to capture the, uh, the effect of uh, things going on right away, and you want to make sure that you can see uh, what's going on. So to kind of put this into perspective and to help walk through that, instead of going out and just doing a feature, this, that, and the other thing, what I wanted to do was to take an application that I've been working on and uh, share it with you and then go down the journey of making this an application that we can really work with. So what I did was I started with an idea and the idea usually is to go out and build something. Um, I talked to my boss and he said, you know, go out and build this application. And so um, this year is a lot, of, a lot of crazy stuff going on, but you know, kids are graduating and they're gonna be leaving the nest eventually. And you know, what does that mean? They're gonna need some guidance. And so I put together an application um, as an example, just to show how we can go out and use like an API to go out and get some wisdom. Um, some might call it a, a, a dad joke, but it's essentially an application that I wrote to be able to go out and pull back a little bit of wisdom when you go out and um, and you want to get uh, some. This application called Ask Dad, and if you click on Ask Dad, it goes out. And it's got a, a nice little uh, thing that has you know information. Uh, every time I come here, you can get uh, more data about it. Um, if you click on privacy, it'll go out and do a uh, Chuck Norris kind of uh, joke. But the idea is that this is great. My dad app allows me to provide my daughters with some guidance, but they might need more than just that. They might need to know what to do next. And so, on my application, I wanted to add something and I called that chores. Okay, so what are chores? Chores are, you know, a list of things that they should do. And what better way to do that than to use this as my example for today. So we're gonna create uh, or take an application that I built, um, starting with my dad app, and we're going to add to it uh, something for the chores. And we're gonna do it, I've, I've already uh, created some code for this and if I, Go out here. I'm going to show you the code on this. Um, yeah. And this is the uh, solution we, we, I created for us for today. Um, it is a uh, ASP.NET Core application that has a model that I created for a chore. So I've got data in here. And since I wanted to be able to run this locally, I created this using SQL Server on my local machine. And I now want to publish it up to the cloud. Um, the way that it works is it takes this data structure, my, my model, and I added a chores controller that goes out and uses that data context to go out and provide information for the chores. If I run this locally, I did include uh, identity on this so that when I create chores, you have to log in and see who has what chores. Um, but I can run this application locally and it'll come up. And what it'll have is my landing page. And it'll come up and you can see here's my hello world. I can click on chores. It's going to make me log in because it doesn't need to know. I put in my identity. Let's call this, uh, I'm going to register. I'll just log in with this. And I'm going to uh, register as a new user. We'll call this devdad at banco.com. Type in a secret password to register. And it will let me, let me see if I can get this right. Once I've registered and created an account, I should be able to log in and work with it. And I'm going to get the data migration. So I'm missing the, the data migrations. Nice thing about uh, MD Framework is it allows me to do that, but here to the application, 
I can say apply the migrations, and it'll actually go out and uh, run the uh, data migrations for me on the local. It's pretty cool. Um, but we'll just stop this and take care of that. But I go over to my um, data environment and I would add migration to work with this. And the idea is that the, um, the database that I'm uh, running this against will have all of the things I need uh, for this. And the idea is that uh, there's my choice database that interesting stuff on this. So the idea is that my uh, application would run locally and I can run this against uh, my environment. Um, if I take this and uh, undo all these changes, you have get is that I can use the back is that I've got an application and we'll just go ahead and delete that. Delete that. And um, go back out, let's run this again. But the idea is that I can go out, I can log in, I can create data, I can work with it uh, from Entity Framework, and I can use it inside of, uh, inside of Azure. And if I publish this up to Azure, I would be able to go out and create a, uh, a regular environment. So if I click on chores, and let's just skip this. And I go out and I log in. And what I want to be able to see is that I've got chores that I put in here and you can see I've put in first things, second things, I can create more things. And this is all updated and running locally. Um, but I want to be able to publish this to the cloud and to Azure, I would look at inside of Azure, the types of things that I want to be able to go out and do. So what I got is uh, the ability to go into Azure and provision things. So this is Microsoft Azure. If I log in, I'm logged into my environment. Um, I can go into my dashboards and I can go to the home page. I can create uh, new things. I created a resource group called uh, WMS for uh, Norway Developer Conference and I've created some infrastructure down here. The way that I've created these infrastructure is I've actually gone through and created a uh, deployment from my application for uh, this resource group. And I actually have that down here where my infrastructure is going to run a, a variety of different things. What I've got is um, a uh, app site, a Linux web app. I've got a SQL Azure database. We're going to use a Cosmos database later. We're going to use a storage account. We have a key vault and some app insights. Um, what I've done is I've created an ARM template that I can go out to and I can browse to this. And this is a uh, place where I can uh, take from my uh, ARM template something that's going to go out and create the uh, WMS Where's My Stuff uh, infrastructure. And I can deploy this uh, into uh, Azure by clicking that link. Now I've already done that. And so what it is, is, it's, is I'm gonna go into here and I'm going to show you that I've added a new kind of a project to this. And that would be a, uh, an Azure resource group deployment project that I can go out and I can create this. 
and then I've pulled in my uh, actual template and I've added this to my solution. And that is what is over here in my solution. So if I look at my deployment, I'm deploying this template. And if you look at the template, what it's got inside of here in the JSON outline is a bunch of different resources that get created. There's a hosting plan site, database uh, values and other, other secrets and other uh, pieces I need for app storage and other things. Um, if I right click and I do the deployment on this, which I ran earlier, um, this lets me go out, connect up to my subscription and then do the deployment. And that created inside of Azure, the deployment of all of these items. Now I've created a database, a SQL database, which is going to be used for storing the information that I'm going to be working with. And you might be wondering, okay, how hard was that to go out and do? And it really wasn't very hard at all. It was an easy thing to go out and create um, the, the SQL database. So what is the benefits of using SQL Azure? SQL Azure is one of the relational types that we can work with. Um, when I look at the uh, types of, uh, of databases we can work with, we've got Azure SQL database, we have MySQL, we have Postgres, MariaDB, even within uh, SQL Server, we have uh, managed instances where it says uh, Azure or SQL running on a VM versus running uh, Azure SQL as a service. And SQL as a service is the one where I can go out and I can just leverage the fact that all the infrastructure has been taken care of for me. Um, an example of working with to, um, if I go back to Azure and I look at my uh, dashboards, You'll see that I've got a dashboard out here created for uh, my site BencoTips.com, which is uh, which is where I start from. So from BencoTips.com, this site is running inside of Azure. It has all of this data. I've got uh, to it my uh, data is running. The nice thing about the database is that I can see and tune and tweak the performance of this application as it's running. I can see uh, graphs of where it, it's going. If I need more performance, I can scale it by going into configure. And in here, I can change the size of the database. Um, right now I'm running on a basic, but I could switch up to a standard or even to a premium uh, workload where I can have the number of throughput units, which are um, performance for a number of queries that I want to run. Um, I can also uh, go to a basic and, and pay less money for it. Each of these has a different price and a cost for what we're going to do. Um, I also have the ability to uh, look at uh, security. One of the things that we want to do is to uh, be able to uh, query this database. So inside of Azure, I can connect to this with any of my database tools, whether it is a SQL Server Management Studio, uh, which I could go out and connect up to um, there's also um, Azure Data Studio, which is the, the next version of, of SQL Server Management Studio. It's, a, it's based on uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, but I can also run queries just directly in here. Um, so if I were to uh, go to the portal and go to the query editor, I just need to log in. And when I log in, it says I don't all so one of the ways that we can sec secure uh, a SQL Azure database is with the firewall. And so on the server itself, when I look at the firewall, um, SQL servers run on top of, uh, a SQL databases run on top of SQL servers. A SQL server is a container that has a lot of different databases in it. And here you can see I've got three or four different databases that I'm working with. Um, I can click on the firewall rule at my client IP address, which I did earlier. However, uh, when my internet dropped, I had to uh, recreate that. Um, but I can go out and I can set up my firewall rules for um, being able to go out and do things on this database. Um, one of the features, or some of the features I can do um, at this point in the server management is working with 
uh, backups, backup and restore. I can manage the backup of databases. And based on the size of the database, I can configure when I want to run uh, different kinds of uh, uh, backup and recovery. Uh, recovery is in recovery for seven days, so I can go back and forth if I need to. Um, I can set this up to work with Active Directory. So if I had an Active Directory that I wanted to attach that to, I can use that for doing identity. Um, I have the ability to work with uh, some advanced data security where I can go out and I can run vulnerability uh, assessments on a periodic basis to be able to go out and give me some information about how secure is my database running right now. Um, there's also the ability to turn on auditing. You know, if I'm wanting to make sure that my application is secure, I'd like to be able to go out and lock it down and then be able to go back and see the logs and watch uh, how uh, people are coming in and working with it. Um, I can configure uh, networking capabilities so that uh, this can, this SQL instance is only available on my uh, VNet so that only internal applications are running inside of my network uh, perimeter are able to see this so it's not exposed to the public. Um, so I've got private endpoints and then um, the last thing is the transparent data encryption, which is uh, encrypting the data at rest. And this is a real important part of this because um, making sure that you can secure that information is a real key part of any data we put anywhere. Um, the nice thing about this is that even once I get done with configuring the server, then inside of the application or the database itself, um, I can get into things like performance. And I can look at the performance of my database, which will let me go out and, and view um, how my application has been running and where I'm getting uh, fast and slow queries. If I want to uh, investigate, I can click through and I can dive deeper into uh, individual queries and be able to see you know, where things are running fast or slow. So let's go back. So here's an example of some uh, data I.O. where I've got some queries that are running. Um, the nice thing about the SQL Azure is that I can dive into these queries and actually see how many it's running, what the query is, uh, what the response time looks like, so that I can uh, be able to investigate and tune and tweak um, the performance of my application all the way down to uh, the database. Now, these are features of SQL Azure, and it's a great tool for taking my application and migrating it into the cloud. So um, the idea of my dad app is that I want to um, this deployment to go out and create my schema and do the deployment. And then I can publish my application uh, from, uh, from Visual Studio, or I could be doing it from a CD uh, pipeline, which is probably the better way to do it using click to deploy is you can, but it's really, you should do, be doing it the other way. Um, but if I look at this and I edit my deployment, um, it's gonna go out, it's gonna do the deployment and it's got a, uh, a data uh, entity framework data migration uh, turned on so that it'll update the database and deploy the uh, schema changes that I need so I can manage my schema from there. But um, when I do that, I can go out and I can click on publish and it'll push out the application. Now this is working with one type of data um, and it is working with a relational engine. Is relational always the way that we... Um, some of the key concepts relational databases include things like uh, the query language using ACID for atomic consistent durable. Um, having a data definition language for describing out exactly what the data looks like, having relational integrity um, so that your data follows um, enforced data types. Um, you have stored procedures and functions so I can create processes to uh, go out and analyze and work with the data. It's, this is great working with, with uh, relational, but sometimes we need to go be start thinking about the NoSQL and why would we work with a non-relational uh, kind of an environment. Um, there's a number of different options that are available for uh, some of these NoSQL data, but the key concepts are that we're talking about uh, 
where relational databases, where, uh, where the um, relational databases allow us to go out and create uh, tables that are related to each other, a NoSQL is a, is a key value, kind of a schema-less uh, data store. It allows us to write out data very fast. It's also going to have less of an engine for doing relationships. And so it's up to the developer and the designer, the architect of your application to figure out how you want to work with that data. So a, uh, working with, for instance, Cosmos includes uh, the ability to work with a multi-model uh, kind of an environment. Um, Cosmos is a, a multi-API uh, data store that is available in Azure. It allows us to work with uh, applications where we can take our existing code uh, and be able to connect it in. Um, so if you're working with MongoDB, there's an API for Cosmos that will let you run, change your connection string and it should just exactly work. Um, you need to load the data, of course, but the, uh, the functionality of that. Um, the nice thing about this is it allows us to do replication at a consistency level that is defined by the application needs. We don't, when we talk about consistency levels, there's different levels of strong where it's, it has to be updated in every environment, every place uh, to eventual, which if you're running a, a globally uh, disparate or disputed application, you may need the opportunity to be able to go out and work with that. Um, you're paying for performance too. Inside of Cosmos, we're paying for so many uh, resource units and you get a, uh, an estimate as to how many RUs are used for each query. So when I go out and I write a query to go against multiple tables, it'll t come back and I can see how many, how much the, those cost. And then I can pay for it. I can provision that much performance and be able to run it uh, for my application. Now the key is, and the trick is, being able to tune it so that you're um, get so that you're using uh, the right amount of performance, and you're not uh, making it making it so that it's it's tuned and working for that. Um, the concept of uh, Cosmos is working more with containers and with documents. Containers are defined in databases. They allow us to go out and create. Uh, something that is a JSON type of a storage. Um, for instance, in this case, we've got a, uh, a, a record which is uh, created here where we, um, but a JSON uh, object document, it doesn't have the relational integrity. It doesn't have the structure. So you can, um, your schema is not defined. You can store whatever you want. Um, if you change your mind or add additional things uh, to it, you can do that uh, as you're uh, running with the application. Um, it supports multiple record types in a single container. And so there's some differences in how you go out and architect your data uh, to work with Cosmos. Um, to give you an idea of what Cosmos looks like, um, I'm going to go back into our application and where we've got the um, where we've got the uh, Cosmos database. This is a Cosmos uh, environment. Um, I created this, provisioned it from the template, and what it has is the ability to uh, go out and you can explore the data from here as well. The data explorer is the collections and the containers. Um, but the way that this is going to work is we're going to go back into our and I'm going to shift to a Cosmos version of this and I'm just going to do that with Git. So we're going to do this, delete that, yes, and to Cosmos. And the big difference in this version of the code with Cosmos is that in the startup file, I've added some code here so that after we added the database context for identity and for our storage, um, I'm going to go down and I'm going to add a Cosmos client where it's going to go out and connect up to Cosmos. 
It's going to create a database if it doesn't exist. Um, it's going to create a container, and we're going to call that. And then we're going to go out and we're going to add that locally. And then it goes through and in the actual controller, because I've added the service for the container on chores, um, in my code for the chores, I have added a Cosmos uh, environment or a container. That then I can use to go out and query and work with this. Where my data context is a SQL server, the container is Cosmos. Working with Cosmos, what I'm going to do is instead where before I was going out and returning back the, uh, the uh, database from SQL, I'm going to go to Cosmos and return back items. So to do that, I've got a query that I run to get Cosmos items and I created a method in here that goes out, creates a query against the database where I'm saying select from F where is done is not equal to true. So I'm going to get all the not done queries. Um, I'm going to create a query iterator and then uh, return back the uh, data as a list. So just like the context SQL gave this, we're not going to get this from Cosmos. A couple of other things that I did was new items is I'm going to add this uh, to um, to Cosmos as well. So under the Cosmos method to go out to my container, I can create the item asynchronously using the same chore. And also when I edit, I want to be able to update and, and work with this Cosmos item. Now, the other thing that I did, a connection string to get to Cosmos. And you might say, okay, well, Cosmos is uh, a SQL or is an Azure construct and it is. If I come back into uh, Azure and I were to go down to my connection keys, here's my connection strings. And I can copy that connection string and then use that uh, in my application. Um, alternately, I've got the Cosmos emulator. So if I search for Cosmos, you'll see I have a Cosmos DB emulator running on my machine. It has a, uh, a version of this actually uh, running and I can go out to it. into uh, the browser on my local host, and then it's got a connection string. Now this private connection string uses the same key for everyone. So um, using that in my app settings down here, let's go back to our startup. We're gonna call this uh, NDC chores. So we're gonna use this in the database NDC chores. And we're going to run the application We'll be able to add items and work with uh, the data from in, in Cosmos. So what it does is we'll go ahead and we're going to log in and say, remember me this time. I'm going to go to I'm a test. And here we're going to go out and we're going to add a new item. So I'm going to create a new item. I'm going to call this uh, work with Cosmos and create it, I'll now see that it's here. If I uh, go into the Cosmos emulator, I go to uh, my NDC chores, which we just created, and in the items, here's the new item we just created. And it's stored as JSON. It's got all the data that I need for that same structure, that same set of schema. Um, work with the data and uh, publish it, query it, update it. And uh, I can use the same code uh, basic framework for doing that. Now, um, that's what that's a, I can then update and work with the data. When I publish this, um, I put this into, uh, into my schema to deploy. And if I go out to Azure, let's go ahead and publish this.
Again, let's edit that. And make sure that this is going to de deploy. The um, nice thing about the tools in Visual Studio is it makes it very easy to work with uh, data coming from a lot of different places. Um, and by the way, I don't see any questions in the queue or in uh, the Slack channel. But if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and come into, uh, into the channel. Oh, good. It's good to know that you can hear me. That's good. Um, so I'm going to save this and I'm going to publish this. And um, and when this gets done publishing, then we can actually run this in Azure using the connection string that was created in Azure. Now, one of the things that we talk about is where's my data like that. This is where I wanted to show you part of my deployment for uh, the, the ARM template is actually kind of interesting because what I've got in here is I have a key vault that I created that has um, a number of different secrets that I created to be able to connect this. And um, let me go to uh, the uh, deployment. Got a connection string. I can go out and I can specify in Key Vault a Cosmos uh, connection string, which is going to actually store this data in a Key Vault. So inside of Azure, what I've got, if I come back over here to the dashboard, is a Cosmos uh, database connection where I can go out and I can work data from here. Um, I can explore the data. Um, And my guess is that uh, the chores that have been created inside of here that I was working with earlier, uh, you can see here is all of the, the data for, uh, for this application, um, is I can lock it down, I can replicate the data in Cosmos globally by simply going out and checking on other data centers I want to send this to. So if I want to send this to Norway or to, um, Norway is currently experiencing high demand. I can go out and I can just pick and save this and it will then create a uh, distributed copy of uh, my database. I can also change the, the consistency level. Right now I'm set for session, which is kind of halfway between uh, strongly consistent and eventually consistent. As you go through and play around with the different consistency levels, you can kind of see what these different things mean. For instance, for strong consistency, that means that data is written in every data center uh, before it continues on to the next one. Eventual means that we write it and eventually the other data centers will catch up. Um, guaranteed to get there, but it can take some time. Um, we also have the ability to specify uh, cross-origin resource sharing or cores. Uh, we can enable this for allowed origins so our applications can specify who can get to different parts of this. Um, we can add uh, functions, we can work with uh, stored procedures written in JavaScript, um, we can work with uh, cognitive search, um, there's ability to lock down the security on this as well. Um, you can also change the scale, so when I'm going out and I'm working, I can change the scale of this to say auto scale as needed. Um, this then allows us to expand out how many uh, resource units we're uh, going to work with. Um, I have a document explorer, query explorer, and script explorer as well. All of these are available within the uh, Cosmos framework. Um, so coming over here to uh, to my environment, I'm going to go to my home page, and I have a version of this set up and running. And if I look at my resource groups, um, I created a version of this earlier and um, I've got the application out here and running. So in the Cosmos database, I've got um, all of the uh, connections for this, but my connection for this application 
is uh, I want to be able to protect secrets. And so if you look at the configuration of how do I connect up an application, you'll see that some of these say that the source is just locally uh, connected up to the environment, like the environment name and favorite color are in app config. But I have a message here that's a key vault reference. The key vault reference, if I go out and I edit some of these uh, connection strings, you'll see that it's going out and it's using a special syntax where I'm coming in and I've got the Microsoft key vault and I pass in the secret URI uh, for the Cosmos connection string. So instead of actually in putting that in here where it's in pretext, it's stored. And the way that I'm able to use that is by having my identity uh, using a system assigned managed identity turned on. And when I do that, then I can go into my resource, into my uh, key vault, and the key vault is where I keep my secrets secret. Um, I go out and I have an access policy which allows this application to come in here and to run. So there's my WMS for 604. Um, the secrets that are stored are going to be all the secrets that I wanted to be able to go out and create for that. Now, um, based on who I'm logged in as here, if I come back over here to this and I go to go to my resource groups and into my this is where my secrets are. Then I can see here's my uh, connection strings, my data context, my message. If I click that, I can see that there's a couple different versions that have been created. Each time I do a deployment, I get a new version of the secret. But if I come in, I can say, well, here it is. I can see what that value is. Hello from Key Vault, welcome to whatever. Um, but this message then is included and pulled into the app service. The nice thing about Key Vault is I don't have to code to it. I can directly inside of uh, the application. Um, so that is working with uh, the Cosmos and a little bit of Key Vault. What I would like to do is talk also about uh, Azure Storage, because once we uh, talk about being able to create and work with data, storage in the cloud is uh, being able to work with blobs, binary data. How do we write stuff like that out, like pictures, images, resources? Um, Azure Storage is a great tool because it allows us to go through a RESTful endpoint to be able to go out and create and upload data as we need to. Um, what we're gonna do is take us into the final version of this app, which is working with storage. And we're gonna stash and continue. And we're going to switch over to the storage version of this. And this is the same application now, but I'm I've added inside of the Azure portal. I created a storage account. And this is a standard storage account inside of Azure that has uh, the ability to work with blobs, tables, queues, containers, files. Um, there's a number of different tools for getting started. Uh, Explorer, which is nice because I can use that to go out and see all the data. Um, I got uh, different startups for SDKs for Java, Python, .NET, um, whatever I want to work with. Um, the neat thing about this is that if I wanted to go out and explore this data, I can do this by uh, going out to the Azure Storage Explorer and then uh, connecting up to it. Um, there are access keys that are associated with uh, a storage account. Um, I can specify geo replication. So if I wanted to replicate this data to another uh, data center, I can if I have, uh, if I've scaled it up to uh, be that type of a storage account. I have cross origin cores available on uh, Azure Storage as well. Um, we can work with the blobs, containers, tables, um, queues, and we can get insights into how all of that is running, do the monitoring. Um, this. Um, what we do in our startup is again for .NET Core is we go out and we add a cloud storage account. Uh, we added add a NuGet package to this 
And what I've done is I've added that NuGet package uh, for uh, for this, and that would my uh, Windows Azure uh, storage. And with Windows Azure storage, um, I'm able to go out and I'm able to create what create a cloud storage account where I parse in the connection string for my storage. I create a blob client. I create a container for uploads. Um, I've got a container that creates it if it doesn't exist. And then I add that service to my, I inject that service into my uh, environment. And I do the same thing with the table client. And I'm gonna up, do uploads for uh, a table called uploads. Um, and what I'm gonna do is show how inside of the uh, chores controller itself, in my model for uh, the chores where I've got a uh, create method, and then I edit. In the editing of this, I've added some code for uh, uploading an image. So I've got an upload image button, and then I've got the uh, file I want to be able to upload. And when I click that, it goes and, and uh, goes into my, uh, my chores controller where I've got a reference where I've injected in my cloud table, my cloud blob container, and I'm setting references to that, and I'm calling an upload method. What the upload method is doing is to uh, pull back that record of that particular chore, and then it's gonna go out and it's going to iterate through uh, a form collection to look for a list of files to be uploaded. The, um, for each one of those files that is in there, it's going to upload a block reference to it by opening up a stream and then uploading from that stream asynchronously. And then when it's done uploading, then we're going to add a table record so that I know that this uh, blob has been added and where it is so that if I wanted to manage it, work with it, tweak it, maybe create thumbnails or something like that, I can. Um, and then I've got a update to, um, to my image URI for my, uh, I'm updating the copy of the SQL. Um, to see this running, if I click on run. And what I will get is an example of the application now running where I can go out and I've got my chores. So it comes up. And we'll give it a second here. And I go to my chores and we've got another one. We're gonna call this work with storage. And I have uh, created this a little bit where I've got the upload image uh, listed here. So I can go out and I can choose a file. Normally I would have a picture that I might wanna go out and upload. So I'm gonna pull a picture of my Grappa Bankovich and I'm gonna upload this. And then once I do that, then you'll see that now this has been uploaded and now I can see that image. And where this got put to is in my local. If I were to go, I go to my storage explorer, which is a download application I can get to, um, just browse out to, let's see if we can get this over here storageexplorer.com. You to a download from uh, Azure for the Azure Storage Explorer. And this is a great tool for being able to explore your Cosmos and your SQL and uh, other uh, storage environments. Um, but with the Storage Explorer, um, I can go out and I can see attached to my local account, it'll go out and load up. And it's gonna take a little bit because it's got the um, different accounts that it's gonna read into from my uh, Azure credentials. And don't need to let you know what I think, uh, but I'm gonna go into my local storage accounts and here's my emulator and here's my blobs, tables, and queues. And so here's my blob for upload I can see the uploads where I've 
been running this and I can test it. And there's my Boris Benkovich picture that I just uploaded. And then in the table storage, I have an uploads table that just got created. And uh, in here is the uh, record as well. So there's the one that we just uploaded. If I run this again, I could then go out and I could work with my storage from here as well. The thing about when I deploy this into Azure, um, then I can work with that data and uh, be able to you know, work with the blobs, the tables, the queues, and following that same kind of a pattern. There's one last type of data that I wanted to share with you, and that is stream. When I look at my dashboard, and I look at the dashboard for, you'll see that what I've got on here is going to be information about the performance, streaming, analytic data, where I can see average page load time, and I can see failed requests. This information is coming from application insights, which inside of my application here, I can add that by going up into my uh, services and I can say add uh, application insights, click on next. This then lets me go out, pick where I want to uh, connect this to. And I've got a, a connection for the 610 version of this, which then pulls in the keys and this is a, a final place where I can work with different kinds of data. Um, sometimes data is streaming. And so stream analytics is a repository that I can write data into at a very high speed, uh, picking up analytic type data. Um, another example where I might have uh, analytics created would be a event hub or an IoT kind of a scenario where I've got devices that are uh, writing out data. Um, the nice thing about this is that when I add that and I deploy it, then it will add that analytics to my application. So I can see the streaming data, I can see the Azure storage, I can see the SQL, and I can see the Cosmos. Um, one application that touches a lot of different things. And that's the beauty of working in the cloud is there's so many different things that we can work with. Um, coming back to, uh, to our slides, um, there's a lot of different ways that we can write and work with data. And in Azure, you've got relational. If it's relational, you can use SQL, MySQL, uh, Postgres, MariaDB. Uh, for non-relational, you can use Azure Storage or Cosmos. Um, if you want to use uh, Microsoft tools to manage it, um, SQL, Cosmos, and, and Azure Storage are all there. The uh, Storage Explorer is a great tool for that. Um, diving deeper into uh, multiple or advanced querying, uh, that's where relational you know, shows a lot of strengths as being able to go after that data in many different ways. Uh, model support, guaranteed performance, and geo-replicable. So that is what I've got to uh, cover. Are there any, if there's questions, go ahead and uh, put it into the, um, into the queue. But uh, we'd love to hear, hear from you and hear what you think. Um, if you're interested in uh, the longer version of this that goes a little bit uh, deeper into each of these different sections, check out my course on LinkedIn Learning. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, visit my blog, fencotips.com. Uh, if you want to connect on LinkedIn, there's a, a, a barcode there you can scan. Um, so with that, uh, we'll look for questions. And uh, if you have any feedback, my email is at benko.com. So with that, Al, are you online also? I think we've got about three minutes left. Um, this is a lot of information and it's hard to uh, you know, cover through everything, but uh, I appreciate you coming in and, uh, and we'll, we'll talk to you next time.